Over the past two decades, the size of wildfires has dramatically increased across the southwest. These large burned areas have become so common that newer wildfires are burning into and around them. Fire managers increasingly use these previous burns as treatments that either stop or slow fire spread. The interaction of past and current wildfires has important management and ecological consequences. Previous fires are playing a big part in how we manage fires right now, uh, especially fires that were within the last decade or so. You know, with, with previous years, you know, managing fire in the Gila wilderness, we've created a, like a mosaic pattern out in the wilderness, you know, with burn scars here, burn scars there that makes it pretty uh, successful for us to manage some fires. In areas that we've had burns before, we get really low to moderate fire behavior. So typically what we do is if we have fires in areas of old burn scars, we try and herd the fires in that direction. In June 2012, the Poco fire ignited on the Tonto National Forest. The fire was burning under extreme conditions and could have potentially grown beyond its eventual 11,000 acres. However, the fire ran into the burned area of the 2011 Bluff Fire, a resource benefit fire which aided in the containment and suppression efforts on the Poco Fire. When the, the Poco Fire ran into the Bluff Fire from 2011, it dramatically changed the fire behavior. The Poco Fire at that time was a, a very active fire making short runs, it was spotting a quarter mile, half mile out. The fuels conditions were extremely dry. So when the Poco fire interacted with the Bluff fire, the fire intensity dramatically decreased. We were able to take advantage of that. We were able to continue our flanking actions around the sides of the Poco fire. And that gave us a couple, three or four days to complete some suppression actions that we we're planning on doing and able to actually implement those. Had the bluff fire not occurred and had the forest not managed that fire, um, the fuels conditions would have been continuous. It would have, it would have continued past uh, the point of where we would have been able to manage it. Uh, it, it, would have, it would have obviously, the fire intensities would have been much greater and the rates of spread much greater and the outcome, I believe, would have been much different uh, on the Poco fire. Over the past 12 years, the town of Los Alamos has been threatened by two of the most destructive fires in New Mexico history, the 2000 Cerro Grande fire and the 2011 Los Conchas fire. The Cerro Grande fire caused large-scale destruction in the town, but fatefully the Cerro Grande burned area saved the town of Los Alamos and the Los Alamos National Laboratory from even more devastating impacts from the Los Conchas fire. Standing in the footprint of both the Cerro Grande fire and the subsequent Los Conchas fire, William Armstrong describes their impact. The only thing that probably kept the laboratory in the town from being incinerated was this, the Cerro Grande, was the Cerro Grande fire. The only thing that saved Los Alamos was the fact that the Cerro Grande fire had burned a scar on the perimeter of the town of the laboratory. Because at least this fire was on the ground and it wasn't spotting and it wasn't a running crown fire. Still an intense fire, but it was not one that, uh, that we couldn't at least get, a, get in front of and stop down there towards the, uh, towards the town and the uh, laboratory. You know, the second burn, the Las Conchas burning through here, you know, following the Cerro Grande fire, I mean, you know, look at the amount of soil that we're still losing. Um, you know, it was not a, this was not a gentle, uh, beneficial fire. I mean, this, this burned with enough severity that, yeah, we're losing a tremendous amount more of topsoil here. Uh, it's, it's cutting these drainages. It's destroying the roads. Um, it's having downstream impacts that, uh, you know, that are, that are proving to be very costly. When you have a fire uh, like the Cerro Grande fire that, that consumes you know, large acres like this, and, but you may have a scattering of trees out here that survived, you know, those are going to be a seed source and a source of regeneration for future forests. A second entry like Las Conchas that comes through though and kills the remaining residual, well, you've lost, uh, you know, you've lost a seed source for subsequent regeneration out there. 
At the time, the Las Conchas fire was the largest in New Mexico history at around 150,000 acres. But that record was easily surpassed in 2012 by the Whitewater Baldy Complex, which grew to 297,000 acres. The Whitewater Baldy burned almost entirely in the Gila Wilderness, and the history of wildfire management in the wilderness was key in its management. The Whitewater Baldy was all up in the high elevation mixed conifer, so we had a pretty severe burn up in the upper elevations at 10,000 feet. But once, once the fire uh, came off the high elevation and started moving towards the east, it transitioned from mixed conifer to more ponderosa pine grass type fuels. And once the fire hit uh, the Miller fire and, and previous fires that we had uh, uh, managed in, in that same area, uh, the fire just hit the ground and, and it was just a, a low intensity ground fire. So, you know, I think probably 50 to 60 percent of the area uh, had seen uh, fire before we had managed fire. So once the white water baldy did hit those areas, it, it knocked it down to the ground. Fire and land managers at the Grand Canyon National Park use previous burns to their advantage, both in managing wildfire and in connecting prescribed fire with previously burned areas to create a mosaic of burned areas that act to break up the landscape and reduce the risk of high severity fire. One of the unique aspects of the Grand Canyon Fire Program is the integration of burn severity data from previous fires in all aspects of fire decision making. Eric Gadula, the fire GIS specialist for the park describes how burn severity data helped with the management of the 2009 Aspen fire. So the first thing we did was we looked at the burn severity fire or the burn severity data and we looked at where this fire was relative to what it was going to burn in and where it was going to move. Keep in mind again the direction of wind is predominantly this way so the rate of spread is north and um, east. So our first initial reaction was this is going to burn in this area right in here that had previously burned in 2001. We had the burn severity data from 2001. So we went in here and we looked and we said, well, this fire is going to burn all in second entry. And the first time it burned was all low and moderate low for the most part. And we knew it would not burn as hot if it had burned somewhere down in here, which was first entry. And secondly, we knew if that fire moved north, it was going to move up into this area that was only two years old, and we had enough solid high severity and higher severity that we were very comfortable that this fire would not move north. So what we did is we went ahead and we allowed that fire to burn, and this fire wound up burning right here in Teal. This was the final perimeter of this fire. And as you can see, as this fire progressed north, it did in fact hit this line right here of this fire and just died. It did not move any farther, but it did move its way back. It backed down and it backed all the way out to here. This fire wound up burning about 5,000 acres and we wound up doing severity then the following year and we got really good effects with this fire. So the burn severity program for, for me I think is critical to the success of this program. And, and we see firefighters to, to our uh, park agency administrators using that burn severity data to make decisions on fires. So if we talk planning for fires, we use that uh, fire history data and the burn severity data to look at the development of planning areas, uh, to look at the development of management action points. It gives them some data to provide uh, some tactical information in terms of can we cut line from the road to this high severity burn area and then just burn out that area knowing that uh, once we get to the high severity burn area it's not going to move uh, much farther than, than that. So instead of cutting maybe three miles of fire line, maybe we can cut a half mile of fire line and uh, use that burn severity uh, just like we would a natural barrier like, uh, like a river or a rock outcrop or just an area with no fuels. In the past few years we've looked at burn severity data from our high, higher elevation mixed conifer burn units and we found that a lot of the high severity patches on the landscape occur on south facing aspects where traditionally those areas would have had more low severity fire, more of a ponderosa pine component. And so what we've done with that information is we've created a new burn plan where we're focusing just on south aspects of particular burn units. We identified those ridges that had southerly aspects and the idea is we're going to come in and we're going to target those and burn those when the conditions are such that we won't generate a lot of heat and a lot of fire 
and we'll, we'll get maybe 20 to 30 percent fire consumption, but we'll limit the amount of high severity. And we also use the previous high severity fire from this road all the way up to this road, and we're not going to put any holding line in here. We're going to allow this fire to back in to this previous old fire back here, because we feel we have enough solid black that it won't move. So when that wildfire does come through, it's got to go through that broken landscape. Um, and so we've eliminated this homogeneous landscape of unburned mixed conifer fuels um, by breaking this up, burning the south slopes, uh, while at the same time not burning the north slopes. And we discovered that and kind of came up with that idea simply because we looked at the fire history, we looked at past fire behavior and similar fuels, and thought we better do something in this big chunk of mixed conifer fuels or we have, the, we have a pretty good potential of losing the entire area if we don't. Science here is at the forefront of the fire management program. And, and, and we see that um, activity and that interest from the superintendent down to our lowest firefighters. Um, there's a lot of interest in what are we doing, what are we accomplishing, what do the fuels really look like out there. So there's a lot of interest in data about fire. So we, we're, we're looking at, at the science of fire all the time here and our regional office has supported that by, by giving us funding to support staff that will help with that type of scientific uh, data gathering and that's uh, GIS and fire effects. So we get that, that monetary support to fill those types of positions and have that staff to be able to go out there and ask questions about how are we doing, what are we doing, and then gather that data and then also help us answer those questions by the data that they gather.